In this episode of Fictional Hangover, we talk about Certain Dark Things by Silvia Moreno-Garcia. Hey everybody, welcome to Fictional Hangover, a podcast about young adult and new adult books, series, authors, and voice actors that is full of spoilers. I'm Amanda. And I'm Claire. You sound really suspicious and up to something. It's fine. <laughs> I'm not up to anything. Okay. <laughs> well, today we're going to discuss Certain Dark Things by Sylvia Marino Garcia. Standard disclaimer. Oh, I need to do it quickly again. If you haven't read this book, please remember that Fictional Hangover is all about spoilers. If you haven't read or listened and don't want to be spoiled, stop listening to us and go read or listen to the book. Then come back. If you haven't done this but want to pretend that you have, or if you don't care about spoilers, or if you just like the show so much that you don't care about any of that, then listen up. The last part is like, and it's, and it's not real words. No, really. it's, it's, it turns into some kind of like jazz, freeform jazz. Uh, yeah, almost. there's some uh, bebopping. And yes. some scatting that happens. There's nearly a beatbox in there. I nearly. Like the next time in the next episode, if I remember, I should just like make sounds in the same pattern that I speak and see if anyone notices. We can do some kind of scientific experiment. We can. And do we do people understand the spoiler alert better <laughs> when it is not verbalized and just noises? <laughs> It's like the T's and C's when like they're adding weird stuff about aliens and and things and nobody ever reads them, but you agree uh, to them. Yeah, okay. I like it. Let's yeah, do it. Let's yeah, do it. That's how it is. That's how it is. Anywho, anyway, getting back on topic, do we have background oh, information for this week's book? We do. Um, uh, can, I can I just say that I really liked the ebook of this because it had lots of good stuff at the end of it. Did you oh. look at the end of the like the the back matter of the ebook? Or did I didn't you even look at the ebook. It? I just listened to the audio book. The, the and I will e-book? admit, I listened to it very quickly. Right, yeah, because we always do. Uh, but the the end of the ebook had an encyclopedia of the different types of vampires in the book, and oh. recipes for drinks, and like a chat with the author and discussion questions so there's a lot of good back matter and this is where my background info came from but i had to mention this because of the month that we're discussing it is angels and demons month so that's just my preface okay for why i pulled this bit from the back matter of the book now the nefarious little smile at the beginning makes sense because i'm talking about angels and i know that with all my heart and soul that you love love angels (laughs) So freaking much. You love them so much, and that is why I included this bit of information. Anyway. Thank you. There's a question. Or there's there's lots of words, and then it ends it's with a, set a question. Up. It ends with a question mark, okay. which is what's important. So the setup is, I like that. Let's talk about sexiness for a moment. <laughs> the sexiness. In certain oh, dark started. things, is alloyed with awkwardness and dread. Awkwardness, <laughs> awkwardness, right here. <laughs> Which the interviewer likes, but they actually want to ask about sexy wing reveal scenes in other media. They're just the best, aren't they? And then, what's your favorite sexy wing reveal scene? And then her. Sylvia Moreno Garcia's response was In the 1980s, Wings of Desire had these angels in trench coats, and at one point you see their wings. It's just briefly there, and the film is beautiful and quiet, and it goes from marvelous black and white to color. The Prophecy came out in 1995, and it's an imperfect movie with some perfect moments. And some of the perfect moments involve angels perching atop, perching like birds atop chairs. There's something bird-like when Christopher Walken is moving around. It makes perfect sense. He used to be a professional dancer, so he has this great physicality. I'm pretty sure Constantine used that film as inspiration, and it is also gr- it also has a great winged moment with Tilda Swinton. So, yeah, people with wings. Not used enough in literature these days. Probably. For I like the reason. end. Probably. <laughs> it's not used, probably. You know, the, I mean, as we will find out, you can have wings and not be an angel. 
That's true. Not be a, a hottie angel you, with weird incestuous relationships. You can have wings and or in be fact dull. be a vampire. Yes. Which is and not be exciting. a dullard being chased after a weird stalk girl. Yes. Yeah. So because it's Angels and Demons Month, it's the end of Angels and Demons Month. So I thought we needed yes. to just wrap it up nicely. Like wings, just being folded in the wings. I wonder if I don't like wings because I'm not a favorite of birds. I, mean, I like some birds, but I don't like a lot of, of birds. Most birds. Birds are evil in the most part. Yeah. I like, but I, I do like a lot of birds, but I like I don't like most of them. I'm know. wondering if that's why I had an aversion to angels, the wings. Is that your initial thoughts? That you're uh, no, my initial thought is, thank God, there's no angels in this. <laughs> no, that's what you said last time. It still stands. <laughs> I stand by my statement. <laughs> that's what you said last it bears time. It repeating. <laughs> I, I will see it next week as well. <laughs> probably will. I think, not not really an initial thought, but more of a preface that there are lots of unique words in this book. Oh, you're apologizing for me. No, no. (laughs) I'm just saying it out loud right now that, well, no, because I didn't really include a lot of them in the summary because it's Aztec and that's hard. That's hard to say. So, yeah, we may or may not butcher some words in the summary and it's fine because even though we both listened to the audiobook which is about to just completely negate what i'm saying that when we mispronounce things it means we you know learned it by reading but but we listened to well, the audiobook so that may or may not be a lie mm, well but it is a lie this is, no it isn't because <laughs> I listened to the audiobook at higher speed, so technically I'm not hearing the words correctly, but also we need to talk about the narration in the discussion. We do, we do. So this is part one of the statement, part two, please see after summary. Yes, very good. Okay. Should we begin? Yeah. Okay. Domingo is 17 and lives in the subway tunnels of Mexico City. He pushes the shopping cart of garbage he collects everywhere he goes. On the night we meet him, he meets Atl, a beautiful young woman with a genetically modified Doberman, and he is precious. Domingo follows her onto the subway just to look at her because he likes people watching. She asks him if he'd like to come home with her. It's not really Domingo's thing, but for some reason he agrees. At Adel's dingy apartment, she reveals she is a Tlawipochli, an Aztec vampire, and that she needs fresh blood. Domingo thought that Mexico City was free of vampires, but here's Adel! He offers his blood, and she semi-transforms into some sort of bird thing before drinking from him. The next day, she tells him he'll need to eat foods rich in iron and pays him for his services. Adel is in Mexico City looking for Veronica, her mother's old, well, Renfield, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what a Renfield is. Everybody knows what a Renfield is. Though Adel hates thinking of assistance like that. Adel is the second daughter of her clan, so she has been used to drinking blood and getting whatever she wanted. But now, her mother, Sentua, and her sister, Izel, her mother's favourite, are dead. Adel is not sure where Veronica is. Maybe the States, maybe Guatemala. But she doesn't have ID or papers, so she's not going to be able to get across any borders. She decides to go get some food to put in her house. She doesn't eat, but if anyone comes snooping, they'll be less likely to think she's a vampire with a tin of tuna in her cupboards. (laughs) In the shop, some teens are being idiot teens. And then the cops show up. Uh Uh-oh, they can't ask her for ID. Also, oh no, the teen dropped the candy he was eating and Adel has the urge to count it. Just stay 
don't Tom. count the candy. <laughs> do it. They'll go away. We'll go away. A cup approaches, and she says she's not with the teens, so he goes on his way. <laughs> don't count the candy. Freaking love that bit. I know. Yes, counting. Rodrigo is out looking for Nick, the arrogant necros vampire he must protect. Oh. They are supposed to be looking for Adol. Well, they wouldn't have to be looking for her if Nick hadn't let her get away, but he did, and now here they are. Nick is at a club looking for girls, but he should not be out. Rodrigo drags Nick back to his apartment. Rodrigo chastises Labola for letting Nick out of his sight, but now Labola has to get Nick a pizza. Everyone, please be aware that Nick is a motherfucker. Yes. And nobody likes him. Yes, he really is. The bingo takes his money he got from Adel and goes to buy the bathhouse for a two-hour bath with lots of good-smelling shampoo mm. ah, and a lovely towel as well. <laughs> then buys new clothes, the first new clothes he's ever purchased, and a watch for Atle, and then goes by her apartment to offer it to her. She brings him inside and realises he might make a good Renfield, her first. She accepts the watch, they go out to eat, and when they come back to her apartment, she asks him to be her friend. She drinks his blood, and then she offers him her own. Renfield deal sealed. You have been Renfielded. You have been, been Renfielded. Renfielded. You have been Renfielded. <laughs> Nick is tired of being inside and mad that Adel got away. And he's mad that she killed members of his family. He knows Labola and Rodrigo are in the other room, so he can't leave through the front door. So he goes to the bathroom, opens the tiny window, and scales down the side of the building like a lizard. <laughs> He's a necros vampire with traditional vampire abilities and, you know, teeth. Not Aztec, like Adol with her claws and stinger. He's better than she is. He goes to a club, convinces a girl to pretend to be Adol with his mind control powers, and takes her outside. She's not Adol at all. He drains her and throws her in a pile of trash. He, he is the pile of trash. He is a pile of trash. Domingo wakes up and Adol gives him juice to give him some strength back. She asks him to look for a man called Bernard Ber Bernardino. I was going to go total British there, Bernardo. Bernardino. <laughs> <laughs> Since she can't. She gives him his address and a piece of jade and asks him to ask Bernardino to help her find Veronica, her mother's former associate, who helped smuggle things across various borders. Bernardino's the only one who can help her, but first they need to rest. Atle lets Domingo sleep on the mattress in her bedroom while she snuggles cosily into her closet burrow. Domingo wants to learn everything he can about real vampires, not the ones in comics, and has just learned that apparently Mexican vampires sleep in closets. <laughs> the more you know. Every day is an education. All Mexican vampires sleep in closets. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fact. It's a fact of life. Sounds quite cozy, actually. You know, making a little nest. Yeah. Nice and dark. Snuggle up. Teddy bear. Detective Anna looks at the body of the girl from the club and knows immediately that she was killed by a necros vampire. But she didn't think that there were any vampires in Mexico City. This one is probably long gone by now. Uh, spoiler alert, he is not long gone. Anna came to Mexico City to get away from all the vampire killings, but here she is investigating this one. It's not like any of the rest of the police officers are going to do anything. Anna goes home, hoping the forensic team will check out the body before it's taken to the morgue, but probably not. She thinks about what she would do if her own daughter, 17-year-old Marisol, were, you know, found like that. Ooh. Marisol is mad at her mother for not having bought groceries or a new school uniform for her, but money is tight. Marisol is ungrateful. Marisol is a little bit of a bitch. Marisol needs a slot. 
Sometimes you gotta slap a bitch. Sometimes you gotta slap a bitch. Domingo goes to the address Atal gave him and finds a creepy old house, Bernardino, who isn't a man but a revenant vampire inside. Revenants are old and twisted but can read minds and heal people if they choose to. They also live by sucking the life force out of whomever they feed on, humans or vampires. Bernardino refuses to help Atal because he doesn't know her and Veronica, the woman she wants him to find, who will know he sent her and no one should know he's here in Mexico City. Domingo pleads, saying Atal needs help. It's a matter of life and death. So Bernardino sends him on his way with a different name written on a note. Elisa Carrara. Anna really wants to solve this case. She goes for a coffee break, and at the cafe, she is greeted by a woman dressed entirely in red. Great. A gang member. Pika is a member of Deep Crimson, one of the human gangs that runs Mexico City, and she and all the other human gangs do not want vampires coming in and messing everything up, especially Nick Godoy. They're after him and the girl he is chasing, Adol. Anna isn't really interested in helping out a gang, but mentions of money start to change her mind a little bit. Kika tells Anna that she can set up a meeting with her boss to get her all the information she needs. Rodrigo is pissed that Nick obviously left the house and hit someone the night before. He goes into Nick's room, pulling the curtains away to give Nick a sun rash. Hilarious. <laughs> Nick's father is Rodrigo's boss and he thinks Nick is ready for this kind of task, chasing down just one vampire girl in the city. But frankly, Nick clearly isn't. No, he's, not. he's an entitled dick. Mm. Rodrigo tells Nick he's in charge and if he goes out of line again, his punishment will be worse than sudden rash. Domingo takes Adol to an internet cafe that won't ask them for their papers and won't likely be searched by sanitation, a group similar to the police that search places making sure that no one is sick and that also no one is a vampire. Adol looks up the name written on the paper Bernardino gave Domingo and discovers that Veronica has apparently changed her name to Elisa. With her contact information found, Adol wants to leave. On their way out, they encounter Quinto, Domingo's friend. Quinto works for the Jackal, the person Domingo used to work for, taking care of his dogs that have been injured in fights. Because not only is the Jackal a drug dealer, but he also runs dog fights. Stand up, mm. gentlemen, the Jackal. Mm. Quinto is sleazy about Adol, and she's not interested at all. So they leave. Before this, and now on the way to Domingo's place, he and Atle talk about vampires. She is an Aztec vampire and part of a drug family and is on the run from another vampire drug family, the Godoys, because they killed her mother and sister. Domingo wants to know more about vampires, like if Atle is part of a harem or if she has a big vampire boyfriend in a kit waiting for her somewhere. <laughs> Do you? Do you? <laughs> Penny he is not subtle in his questions. <laughs> She does not, and she's not interested in a boyfriend, especially a human one, she tells herself. She leaves Domingo in his home in the tunnels underground and tells him to meet up with her before sundown. I love, like, how clueless Domingo is, and he's just like, I like to read comic books about vampires, so t tell me everything. It's important. I need to know everything. I can imagine him picking up a particular issue and throwing it out of face, like, really too close and going... Is this accurate? <laughs> yeah. Do you do this? Do you, can you do this? What about page 16? Can you do this? <laughs> no, dude. No, dude. Nah. No, Bless. No. He's enthusiastic, though, you know? He is. Bless you can't. Him. You can't discount that. No. Anna goes to the meeting set up by Kika and meets the leader of Deke. Deke? And meets the leader of Deep Crimson. Kika is there too, and they discuss what they want from Anna to kill both vampires, Nick and Adol. Anna claims she is no Van Helsing, what they call vampire hunters in the UK, but then they offer to pay her a great deal of money as a consultant, so she agrees if they will pay her half up front. They do. Thank you Anna very much. <laughs> yes, thank you. 
Anna has actually killed several vampires before and might be the only person in Mexico City with the knowledge necessary to kill them. So she actually kind of is a Van Helsing, whether she wants yeah. to be or not. Yeah, she's badass. She's a vampire hunter. She's not a vampire herself, though. <laughs> Clear that up. Not okay. a vampire vampire hunter. There we go. I was waiting for that. Yep. Domingo meets back up with Atl, who isn't doing so well. She's used to feeding whenever and wherever she wants, as much as she wants. But now, uh, yeah, she's got to control herself. She could just eat Domingo, but she doesn't want to. She actually kind of wants to keep him safe. She doesn't want him to be a boyfriend or anything, which she thinks in her dead sister, Ezel's voice is like ridiculous because dating human, ew. Mm, mm. But you know what else is ridiculous? Yeah, talking to your dead sister. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah, she's just really losing it. <laughs> she is losing it right now, currently. Oh, bless. This next part is my favorite, and I apologize in advance. For the high pitch squeeing that's going to happen. I'll turn the volume down my earphones. <laughs> Domingo and Adel travel to meet the woman Bernardino sent them to find. On the subway, Adel's hands begin to shake. She needs to eat because her sugar level is dropping. Apparently, when vampires don't feed, they have hypoglycemic episodes. It's a diabetes thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway excuse me i shouldn't be happy that people have you know diabetic no it's like, representation it matters <laughs> i guess you're right okay i'm done now they make it to elisa's office and Adol convinces her to help get her and domingo across the border into guatemala they agree to meet a week later to retrieve their papers and get a ride this woman definitely used to be veronica definitely used to work for Adol's mother and now that her mother's dead she claims she owes them no allegiance, but somehow Adel's able to convince her to help. Does she say please? Maybe. Does she offer her money? Half up front. Half up front. Money and a polite manner can get you all yeah. little places. Yeah, Mo mostly the money. Mostly the money, yeah. When they get back to the apartment, Atl is feeling very weak, so Domingo offers his blood, but Atl refuses and lies down. Domingo offers to bring her some tea, and when he touches her, he has a vision of a turtle and running across a fence and holding a gun and them holding a severed head. Atl tells him that he is seeing her memories, which is what happens when they share blood. Surprise! Side effects! <laughs> Ooh. Nick is pissed because Rodrigo has confined him to his room and is only letting him drink blood bags. He would much rather drink Adol. He remembers when he first met her in a club and she turned him down because he, you know, 100% obviously was a shitbag. He, of course, got offended because she didn't want to sleep with him and also threatened to cut his dick. Now, he calls his father, who's like the biggest drug-dealing vampire around, and says he wants to keep Adel and torture her. His father says he'll think about it. Daddy, I really want a hip-hop horse and a vampire in my torture chamber. <laughs> so you asshole. I love that he's very extremely posh and British. But father, I want a horse in my torture chamber. I can't remember. It's it's from a British skit where the guy where there's an entitled child and all he wants is a, a hip hop horse, and I can't remember which what it is. But yeah, I want a hip hop horse. It's ridiculous. In my torture chamber. In my torture chamber. <laughs> we know my accents should not be done in any kind of recorded <laughs> facility slash aired onto the internet forever. So you're getting posh Brit. Because at least oh, I can take no, it no. myself. Father, I want a hip hop horse. <laughs> but it has to be in my torture chamber. In my torture chamber with, my, with the vampire. <laughs> Anyhow. 
<laughs> when Domingo wakes up the next day, Atle is still asleep, so he goes out for a bite to eat. When he gets back, there are sanitation workers doing a sweep of the building, which definitely isn't good for Atle. He nonchalantly rushes up to the apartment and wakes Atle. She hears the crew coming, so she climbs up on the roof. Domingo greets the workers, pretending that he lives there with his dog, who is obviously Atle's dog called Koali. But he doesn't have papers or ID because, you know, he's only a wee baby of 17. The sanitation workers make sure he's not infected with any diseases, which is nice. And also quite dystopian future. And tell him he's got to get registered. Him and his dog. He says he will. Atle comes back inside, kind of in bird form, completely with feathers, and devours a box of sugar cubes. Domingo offers his blood, which she accepts after some convincing. They talk about how she feeds with a proboscis. It's a lovely word. And Domingo wants to ask a million more questions because, of course, you would want to. But, you know, there's something they need to do first. Kevin Domingo, leave the apartment to acquire a gun. Ah. I'm sorry, we cannot talk about my feeding proboscis right now because we have to go and get a gun. And hip hop holes. And hip hop holes. But I told her today, Ma. Yes. <laughs> Domingo, we've latched. Domingo takes Adol to somebody he knows from when he used to be a street kid. And Adol is able to get a very big, very fancy double barreled gun. Ooh, nice. I As assume. they leave. Domingo tells the story of how he got out of the group of street kids, which involved trying to keep a girl safe from a predator and, you know, the boss of everyone, the jackal. When the jackal made Domingo lick his feet clean, Domingo left, which meant Ooh. he left the girl behind. Adel wants to comfort Domingo, like to hold his hand maybe, but she changes her mind at the last second. Whoa. What? Would you rather lick some dude's feet? Nope. Or anything else? Nope. Anna is sifting through paperwork, trying to find Athel or Nick, where she finds a report from the sanitation checks about a boy and his dog. She thinks of the boy with Athel and decides to scope out the area to see if anybody nearby has seen her. Jackpot! At the store near the apartment, the cashier said he had seen the girl in the photo and assures him and that she left quickly the other day. While trying Anna... very hard not to count candies on the floor. <laughs> with her tin of tuna and her energy can. Anna meets up with Kika. Ki- Kiki? Anna meets up with Kika to let her know she found Atle, but not Nick though. Kika says to get ready because they're going after Atl soon, and since she never killed a vampire before, and Anna has, she has to be there. Anna goes home excited about the money she's making from helping out these criminals because it's going to be enough to get her and her daughter out of Mexico, and honestly, that's all she wants. That's it. That's the that's sound goal. Yeah. And a hip-hop pause for her vampire. And a hip-hop pause for my torture chamber. <laughs> Rodrigo is thinking about his youth before he was a Renfield working for Nick's father and, you know, trying to keep asshole motherfucker Dick, uh, Nick in line. This doesn't happen. He liked to drive fast cars, but that's how he got dragged into this life. At least now he has learned about a cop, Anna, who has a lead on Adol. Finally, he'll be able to kill her and move on to something else. Then Nick's father calls. He tells Rodrigo that he will not kill Adol because Nick wants to play with her. Oh, great. Ugh. In his torture chamber. Ugh. Ugh. Adol, Domingo, and Koali leave the apartment so Domingo can eat something and are ambushed by Anna, Kika, and some others. Atle shoots a few of them and Koali rips the throats from a few more. But then Domingo gets captured and is being shoved into the trunk of a car. Atle gets to kill him and kills his... <laughs> gets to him. To kill him. <laughs> oh, 
God, that would be good. Athel gets to him and kills his attackers, but she gets hit by a few silver nitrate darts and starts going into shock. She grabs the attacker's keys and they drive away, but then she pukes and everything gets worse. It's always worse after you've puked. It is. Domingo takes her into the tunnels and gets the silver darts out, but there's still something wrong with her. Domingo leaves Koali with Atle and goes to get his buddy Quinto, who works on the Jackal's dogfight dogs. Quinto freaks when he sees he's helping a vampire, but Domingo threatens him with Koali. Quinto gets the silver darts out and Atle is able to rest. But then the Jackal shows up. Wah, wah. Adol dreams of her sister's death, and while there have been scenes before in the book of running and guns and turtles and decapitated heads, this dream has more detail. Adol is mad that Nick and his gang killed their mother and some cousins, but now that Izel is in charge, she decides to do nothing to retaliate, which makes the others in their family think that she's weak, and honestly, kind of samesies. Adol, though younger and the unloved second daughter, refuses to let this slide. So she sneaks out to the Godoy place, kills a pregnant concubine and several teens, and returns home. Izel is pissed because she knows they're going to come for them now, and they do. <laughs> Instead of fighting, Adol hides in a refrigerator, a small, safe, cozy little space. When she comes out, everyone's dead. Wally trots up, though, somehow, still alive, and they run. Atle wakes up in a holding cell where the jackal keeps his dogs. She's desperately weak from the silver poisoning but wants to fight her way out. She refuses to take blood from Domingo, sure that she'll kill him with barely a second thought. She wants to drain him dry, but she doesn't want to at the same time because she wants to keep him safe. Maybe children come later. She tries to get up and promptly goes down again. The jackal comes with his entourage and is posturing and preening and talking about getting lots of money from the Godoy gang for capturing her. But then he gets a call from them. They've arrived, so he's got to go and greet them. Suddenly, Adol has a seizure, and Quinto rushes into the cell with epinephrine. Ha <laughs> just kidding, she's not having a seizure. She takes the needle and shoves it into Quinto's eye, then tosses the knife she keeps in her jacket directly into another guy's forehead. She breaks another's neck and then drinks from the jackal's girl that he left behind, but Domingo stops her from draining her dry and convinces her to leave through a back entrance while they can. Nick is being a twat. <laughs> Father! My Full horse. sentence. I want a hip hop horse. Hip hop horse. Uh, there is more to that sentence. Well, Nick is being a twat, but even still, <laughs> Rodrigo invites him to go with him to retrieve Atl. When they get to the Jackal's place, they discover Atl has escaped, but not long ago, so they catch up. Violent fights, bites, and fierce gunshots ensue. But luckily, Atle, Koali, and Domingo managed to escape again. Poor Nick is now missing half his jaw. Womp, womp. Lots and lots of teeth. But he did get a good bite on Atle's hand before she shot his face off, which isn't going to be great for either of them. No, no, it's not. Mm -mm. Domingo leads Atle away from the jackal's place, and just as she's about to eat him... They make it far enough away and find a cab. Adult chokes the driver and gets him to take them to Bernardino's. At first, Bernardino doesn't want to let them in, but he finally relents. Then he realizes how badly Adult is injured. Her bite wound from Nick and the infection it caused will kill her in her silver weakened state. So their only option is to amputate. Right now. Ooh. Ooh. Bernardino, who used to be a surgeon a hundred years ago, saws off Atle's hand, but don't worry, it'll grow back. Then he heals her and takes away her hunger with his revenant life force. Afterward, she can get up and move around easily so they get cleaned up. 
Atle needs help getting dressed and Domingo shows up just in time. Atle hates needing help and not knowing what's next, so she cries as Domingo hugs her. Imagine she didn't cry for her dead sister or mother, but now she's crying over her hand. What is she doing? Oh! She pushes Domingo away. One-handed. One-handed. Domingo leaves and takes a bath and puts on a handsome outfit set out for him. As he's contemplating going to be with Adol, Bernardino stops him and tells him that no good can come from the two of them and his infatuation with her. In the end, vampires are only their hunger, nothing more. Domingo goes to Adol anyway, and she invites him in her room and to sleep in her bed because she'll be sleeping in the trunk at the foot of it. Tiny little, safe little snuggle place. As they talk about vampires a little and about how Adol's killed several people, almost him a few times even, so he should just go. But Domingo refuses to leave her. Rodrigo pulls Nick away from the boy he's mutilating with his half jaw to clean him up and bandage his wounds. Nick is furious that Rodrigo let Atle get away, but obviously he had to take care of idiot Nick instead. Rodrigo mentions that Atle had been poisoned with silver nitrate, which means that someone else wants her dead too, and he knows who that is, Detective Anna. Rodrigo plans to seek her assistance, but first Nick has to heal. Rodrigo buys a prostitute for him to eat. Adol wakes to music playing from Bernardino's record player. He checks out her wound and they discuss how her mother and sister died. And then Bernardino shares the story of how he met Adol's mother. She rescued him on horseback during the revolution, even though they were of different vampire clans, which is normally frowned upon. They stayed friendly, or at least as allies, for a long time. He gave her a jade necklace, which is where the jade bead Adol had at the beginning came from. Her mother told both Adol and Izel that if they showed Bernardino those beads, he would help. And he has. Domingo arrives then, and they discuss going to meet with Elisa to retrieve their papers. Domingo offers to go alone because Adel is so weak, but she vehemently agree- disagrees. Bernardino agrees with Domingo that Adel is best, but offers to go with them to lend her his strength. Anna is pissed. Because of the violent vampire massacre at the Jackals, she has been replaced as the lead in finding Atl and Nick. Kika calls and, at a nearby restaurant, they discuss how even though Anna's not in charge anymore, she's still valuable to Deep Crimson and that they still want her help. Anna goes back to the police station, trying to decide if she's still going to help the gang when a witness comes in. Anna speaks to the man who turns out to be the cab driver who took Atle, Domingo and Koali to Bernardino's. Anna takes a tip and decides to continue helping Deep Crimson. Adol, Bernardino and Domingo meet up with Elisa, who, after seeing the massacre on the news, has decided she can no longer smuggle Adol and Domingo out of Mexico City. She still provides their documentation, though, which is good, but how will they get out of the city? Domingo knows exactly how. They'll walk. There is a trash dump that crosses over the border that no one but the people who work there know about. It'll be easy. Sure. Sure it will. Mm -hmm. But then, how will they get into Guatemala? Bernardino knows a guy. Manuel. So they go speak to him next. He needs a little time to prepare and a little cajoling, but eventually they have made an escape plan. Bernardino heals Adel again before they leave his place, because everyone was right. She's really, really weak, but she's okay again for now. When they get back to Bernardino's place, Adel and Domingo argue a bit about Domingo calling her weak, but Really, he just wants her to be safe and even apologises for sounding like a dick. Atle doesn't deal well with needing help, but now she needs his help again to get undressed. They end up sleeping together, which is what they both probably wanted all along, more or less. Anna goes to a contact she has in search of information about the location where the taxi driver took Adel, Domingo and Koali. She heard once that a vampire lived in that neighborhood, but didn't know for sure. 
After meeting with this sleazy guy who owns a tea shop that is probably actually a cover for a brothel, she knows that a vampire really does live there. On her way back home, she gets a call from the Godoy gang, who threaten to kill her daughter if she doesn't meet with them. So she does. Rodrigo and Nick question Anna about how she knew about the vampires, and she plays dumb. But then Nick bites her and feeds her his blood, putting her under his control. Anna explains she's been working with Deep Crimson and tells them where Adel is now and says that she was going to call and tell Deep Crimson. They allow her to do that in the hopes that their gang will get to her first and make their capture easier. They're not Doing... very smart. Just go straight there. Domingo and Atle, naked in bed, talk about vampires and whether or not, as an anti-tech vampire, she can fly. Kind of, yes. She has wings, but she flies more like a turkey than anything else. But she can glide, and her wings are beautiful. Domingo wants to see them, but Atle's wings are private. And then they talk about seeing each other completely naked, so she decides she will show him. She unfurls her huge and glorious shiny black wings and unfolds to mingle in them. Mm, it's the sexy wing reveal. And talk of turkeys is involved. Make <laughs> pop holes. I will torture the turkey next to my hip hop hole. <laughs> Later, Bernardino checks on Adel's hand. It's growing back slowly, and he thinks she won't have any damage or scarring. He asks her about her developing relationship with Domingo and what her mother would say if she knew Adel was in a relationship with a human. <gasps> well, she's dead. She's not going to say anything. Bernadino thinks it's a bad idea, but Adel craves a companion and a connection. So Bernadino can go, for, go to hell for all she's concerned. Domingo knows Bernardino said something to her, and Adel knows she shouldn't lose her head over a boy, but here she is, despite Bernardino's repetitions that vampires are nothing but their hunger. In the middle of the night, Kuali barks just once. <gasps> Intruders! Anna and Kika and some cronies have broken in. Atel climbs on the ceiling in, a dark in the darkness like a lizard and drops down taking out a couple of cronies, but then she's flashed with UV light. There's a shout for Kika to hit Atl with a huge dose of silver nitrate, and so, blind and about to be silvered, Atl raises her hands to protect herself, but then there's a shout from Domingo, two gunshots and a smell of blood. Anna is being controlled by Nick and is disgusted by the thoughts going through his head about what he wants to do with Adol and his plans to kill Anna and her daughter after he has Adol, but she can't do anything about it. He telepathically tells her he wants Adol alive, so instead of letting Kika dose her with the silver, Anna, Anna shoots Kika and the remaining crony. Then she's knocked out by Domingo. As she's down, she regains her own thoughts, so that's good, but she watches and listens as Adel, Bernardino, and Domingo make hasty plans to get Kowali and escape to the trash dump. They leave, and shortly after, Nick arrives. He feeds Anna his blood again to put her back under his control, and is pissed that Adel got away again. But Anna knows where they're going and tells him whether she wants to or not. No, Nick is such a dick. Atle, Domingo, Bernardino, and Kuali run down the street, steal a car, and drive to the landfill. Unfortunately, they don't make it very far in before they realise their pursuers have caught up. Bernardino convinces Domingo to hide with Kuali, and Atle gives him a knife. Domingo doesn't want to leave Atle, but does, as they say, not too long after he gets into a hiding place, a man shines a flashlight in his face and tells him to come out. 
Koali growls and attacks, and the man aims a gun at the dog, so Domingo rushes him with the knife. It barely stops him, but then Koali attacks again, this time going for the man's throat. Just when Domingo thinks everything's fine, Koali gets shot, and a woman brings him outside. <laughs> Nick is, of course, pissed about having to go into a landfill, but sees Domingo run and hide, so he sends La Bola and Anna to retrieve him. As he's waiting, he hears a startled sound from Rodrigo, who has just been attacked by Bernardino. Nick sends two goons to take Bernardino down, but they are terrified of him and both get eaten almost immediately. As Bernardino is distracted with his meal, Nick pins him down with a metal rod. Nick then realizes that Rodrigo is still alive, but practically a mummy, so he laughs in his face before crushing his skull. Anna arrives in with Domingo and without La Bola. Oh well. Nick zaps Domingo with a cattle prod and gives Adel to the count of three to come save him. Atal just wants to run. She hid when her sister was murdered. She's nothing. She's not brave. She's not a warrior. But she's also not leaving Domingo behind. She arrives just as Nick reaches the end of his countdown. They have a standoff, Nick holding Domingo, but then Domingo stabs Nick with Atal's knife. He's stunned more than hurt, but then Atal attacks, ripping the knife from his belly and driving it into Nick's eye. They fight, and then Anna shows up and shoots Atle. Atle breaks a few of Anna's ribs, and she pulls a silver bullet out as Nick comes at her with the knife. Then Domingo is there and crashes the metal bar that was holding Bernardino in place into Nick's head. Nick roars, and Atle can tell he's going to kill Domingo, so she leaps at Nick, wings unfurling, and flies him off the ground, her talons digging into his face. Anna comes back to herself for a few moments and is able to shoot Nick, but then he controls her mind again and makes her kill herself. As she's dying, free from his mind control, she's pleased to see Bernardino approach Nick. Nick is trying desperately to bite Adel, and she's holding him at bay with her talons, but then Bernardino grabs his head and drains him of his life energy. His eyes shrivel up, his hair falls out, and his teeth pop out too. When Adel sees Bernardino again, his hair is black instead of gray, and his skin is less wrinkled. But then, he comes for her too. It's true what he said. They are their hunger, after all. She's not afraid of dying, but asks that Bernardino spare Domingo's life. Bernardino grabs Adel by the throat and breathes his life back into her. Oh. Domingo rushes over to make sure Adel and Bernardino are okay, and then Bernardino sends them on their way to meet Manuel so he can smuggle them out of Mexico. They part ways and Atl asks where Koali is, but Domingo has to tell her that he was shot and is probably dead. They walk on through the dump and out onto the street. And when Atl takes an envelope out of the bag with all their papers and money and gives the bag to Domingo, she tells him she's going on alone. She doesn't need him anymore. He's crushed and fights for her, but she kisses him one last time and says she'll get him killed. And then she leaves him behind. Oof. Domingo lets Atl go. He turns and walks back through the dump and hears a small whimper. It's Koali! He's alive! Domingo finds the dog and a shopping cart, puts him inside, and together they leave the landfill. Some days later, Domingo, resting with Koali at his side, has a dream of Adol, cutting her way through the jungle with a machete. He says her name, and she looks up and smiles as if she heard him speak, but continues on her way. The end.
everyone process that for a few minutes not for a few minutes for like 30 seconds while we play this promo for another podcast Ooh. Processing. is it a scary processing. promo processing processing Processing. yes 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 it will be I don't know what it's going to be for, but it's going to be really hella scary. I don't even know if we have a scary one. Well, we why need not? A scary one. I don't know. We Let's a find a one. scary podcast who wants us to share their information with everyone. Yes. Yes. Okay. So standout moments. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a hot intro. <laughs> I like the law. Yeah. That was wow, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, very interesting. It was probably my favorite thing about the entire book. Yeah. Like, I like the, the discussion about European vampires and the Mexican vampires and the physiological differences between them. Yeah. Honestly, you could do it like an encyclopedia book about it and i yeah, would read the yeah. heck out of it and there's like 10 different types of vampires and they're all different and that's what's in the back of the ebook like there's a there's a chinese one which they do mention in the text but it's like one half of one sentence and they like can barely move at all and it looks like they're floating and then there's another one that like glows in the dark like what are all these super awesome types of vampires and why aren't we always reading about them yeah, why does it always have to be the, the stupidly hot studs? I mean, I'll keep the stupidly hot studs. Yeah, but, but add they in, in the dark? all of the other ones as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of want like a vampire book now, which is sort of like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, mm -hmm. where each of the vampires are different types of vampire. Mm -hmm. And then The Bachelor or The Bachelorette has to pick which vampire she wants and she goes for like the weirdest one yeah not the studly hot one no she goes the one for the that, weird one like the one, glow, that, like one that glows in the dark glows or the one the that dark. doesn't move yeah yeah we just had such a connection oh, they listen to everything that like i yeah. said they just i can't tell. i think that the, the chinese one that doesn't move very much like they have the ability to put their consciousness into like a human for a little while. And so if the bachelor or the bachelorette chooses that person, do they also get to choose like a human that their consciousness can go into? Well, I mean, they it's may have their one. own, you know, Renfield that they use to do that. You know, the person yeah. who they feel most comfortable sharing their consciousness with, inhabiting, yeah. possessing. Possessing. Yeah. A puppet is a possession that possesses the possessor. <laughs> callback. Yes. This one is yes. full of callbacks, though, by the way. Really? Can I skip ahead to my Go. surprise? Yes. That there was a needle in the eye oh. and the sawing off of a hand. Yes. And a dog hero. Like, didn't yes. we literally just read this book last week? Does This one has more vampires in, but... In, That's in, true. In gangs, but yeah. Yeah. Needle in the eye and sawing off hands. How? That's like not a thing that you read about every day, but clearly we're reading about it back to back. I I suspect we've missed the haunted doll at some point in this one. There's got to be a haunted doll. No, no, no. Manuel, who has, uh, who's going to help them, lives in a place and there's fucking dolls pinned <gasps> to the walls. So no, it's there. Pupkin is there. Oh my god! You can't tell me that Pupkin is not like attached to that. Pupkin guy's is wall. there. Pupkin, Pupkin is, is there. on that wall. Pupkin is pulling the strings. Oh my gosh! It's amazing. It's amazing. This is How to Sell a Haunted House, the prequel, because that book came out several years ago and How to Sell a Haunted House just came out this year. <laughs> no original stories, is there? No. Except for also, I'm pretty sure this one is set in the future. <laughs> so Yeah, it has a dystopian future ring to it. Yeah. Which I quite liked, you know, the whole idea of the sanitation people who go around and test for diseases and vampirism. Yeah. But then they start listing off all the infectious diseases. And I was like, 
damn, my friend is a, an infectious disease nurse. I'm like, Fee, you need to up your game here because <laughs> this dystopian future is not good. No. Mm-mm. No. 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 But I did enjoy it. I did like that kind of aspect yeah. to it. The law, beautiful. Yeah. This is like a very different type of vampire book than we normally oh. would talk about. And I, oh, I kind of love it. I enjoyed it. I struggled with it a little bit because I I don't tend to read books where it's like gang violence and drugs and that kind of like yeah. mafia almost sort of fighting. I don't tend to read a lot of those. So I, I struggle to enjoy them. I don't particularly enjoy those as a movie either. Yeah. Necessarily. Um, eh. I mean, John Wick is the only one I can think of that has any kind of semblance, which I do adore. Yeah. And if I'm honest, this had John Wick vibes for me because Nick yeah. was the Alfie Allen character from the first one, a whiny oh. little entitled bitch yeah. who's the son of the gang leader and thinks they deserve absolutely everything and has to have somebody looking after them. It's like, shit, man, you know you were going ass adult. You don't need a babysitter, but quite clearly you do because you're a psychopathic asshole misogynist. Yeah. Nick was the worst. Nick was the freaking worst. I hated Nick. Yeah, he was a fucker. I hated Nick. I am devastated for Anna. I yeah. really liked Anna as a character and I was really rooting for her. I'm thinking, okay, but maybe it's when she meets Atle. She might not be, you know, the vampire hunter that just automatically kill. They might have a conversation because she seems like she could be a reasonable person and not, you know, shoot first and ask questions later. But then she died because Nick is an asshole and controlled her mind and made her do it. And oh, I'm so yeah. frustrated. Yeah. And I having oh, I'm good for her. Absolutely good because I really like that character. And it's one of these. Again, where it's like, oh, I really like this character. Oh, they're dead. Sorry. Yeah. No. Um, I really liked all of the fights between Adel and Nick, and I thought it like it almost was a little bit comical that like every time Adel gets away, and Nick's like, oh, she got away again. Like, man, clearly you suck, but like she just keeps escaping, and I kind of liked that. But He's I really, wily. Yeah. I really loved when they were at the Jackal's place and she fakes having a seizure. Because, like, she was vomiting up blood and stuff. It was a serious thing. And then she was like, nah, stab, knife, I... neck snap. Like, she committed to wow. the bit. She, she was 100% committed to the bit. Yeah. And honestly, that scene could have only got better if when she, she was like, no, I'm lying. She was like, psych! If she had then, said psych, that would have been it. Oh, honestly, that would have just had me done. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. I really liked Atal as a character as well. Um, What I didn't like was Atal and Domingo's relationship. I like Atal. I like Domingo. Um, I like them as individuals. Yeah, I like them as a friendship, but I did not want them to go into a romantic slash physical relationship. I didn't want that. It happened. Yeah, yeah. It didn't it, need to, in my no, opinion. No, it it happened, but at least it was only like in. I mean, the chapters in this book are really short. Like whenever it switches to a different character, most of the time it's a different chapter. So. Their their romancy relationship really only lasted for a couple of chapters. Like I'm glad that it wasn't drawn out and the whole entire thing is about them being in love with each other and like fucking on every other page. I'm glad that that didn't happen and that yeah, same. she did like a lot of the time wanted to keep him alive because she just like cared about him. And he obviously is, a, you know, a goofy ass teenager who's obsessed with vampires 
And so he wants to know everything. And of course, he's going to be infatuated with her because she's beautiful and also a vampire. I feel like that would be us. Like if we yeah. were a vampire, oh, we'd just oh. be like, hi, and then like pull our clothes off. <laughs> hey. Hi. Hi. Oh, I just, oh, oh. Yeah. No, I get it. And I, I really loved Domingo's fanboying. Yes. I, I adored it because it was like, yeah, that is so relatable. And the fact he's got all the comics and stuff. And I'm like, I could pull half a dozen vampire books off my shelf right now. Yeah. And I'll be like, yeah, okay, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to this type of thing. But if all of, and he's got so many questions, but if all of you, all your education has come from reading comic books and not actually meeting the people, you're going to ask a lot of questions and you're going to ask a lot of cheeky questions. Yeah. I love when he was like, so do you have a vampire boyfriend and he's really big and he wears a cape? And she's like, why would he wear a cape? What are you talking about? He's like, capes are cool. Cape, capes may be cool, but they're not very practical. But I love it. Like, they had, you know, it. this book was kind of funny. Uh, the Domingo especially. He was he was the co- he I'm not gonna say he was a comic relief because that feels like I'm giving him a disservice as a character. You know, you think they have the goofy person in just to and they could take him out and the story would be better. It can't. Domingo needs to be in there. Domingo yeah. is a humanity yeah. that all of the char- vampire characters need to have. Even if Rodrigo is technically human, he's been a Renfield for too long and yeah. he's been around vampires in this well too much along domingo is sweet and innocent bless him and he does fall quickly he does fall hard but i think it's not love and they don't use the l word to my recollection i don't he has an infatuation and he sees a beautiful lady who is a badass and he appreciates her for being a badass lady as well and doesn't want her to change and he apologizes when he is being the stereotypical male character yeah he's like oh sorry i didn't mean to do you know he holds his hands up and apologizes yeah whereas nick is the absolute you know stereotype antithesis of all this negative toxic masculinity Domingo was the antidote. Yes. Oh, you know what? I just I just had to double check. Domingo does at the very end say, like, but but I love you. But then I was like, nah, nah dog, I gotta go cut my way through the jungle. Can I forgive him it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm going to forgive him it. You know, it's at the end. It's at the very end and she's leaving him and he like, it's you know. It's parting. And wants... it might not be, but they've been around each other at that point for a fair amount. So, yeah. yeah. But I did like the fact that she, Atle explained it, or at least that's how her mother and sister explained it to her is, you don't play with your food. I really like that. <laughs> Me too. You know, as much as we were, well, I guess he's still different. I was going to say, as much as we were talking earlier about how, like, we liked the different types of vampires, I really liked Bernardino and his and his powers. But no, he doesn't drink blood. He drinks life force, so never mind. But I really, really liked him. Me too. Especially at the end, when he just, like oozes out of the side and it's just draining people in the background and Anna's or Anna's like see you back there see you back there and he just like walks across and you know eats Nick while wow, she's dying she's you like, know yeah. well if you've got to say something as your last vision you want to see the guy who basically killed you getting the comeuppance yeah which is super satisfying as a reader. Like, I didn't feel like... I don't feel like as I've finished the book, I've got too many loose ends that I need to have the second one. I could read this as a standalone. Like... It is a standalone, isn't it? 
It is at the moment, but quite could quite easily, I think, continue. The story oh, could I continue. Oh, I see. Okay. I misunderstood. Sorry, I'm not explaining it well. Like, I've read it and you could stop now and you would be very satisfied with the story. Yeah. However, if there were more to explain, you know, how Atl fares in Guatemala, how she probably would come back to Mexico City to get Domingo, and how she would take out Nick's father's family in the Godoys. Yeah. Then I would, I you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that was to come out. But you don't need it. No. Um, I first agree with everything you said. However, I think that maybe more than coming back for Domingo, she would come back for Kuali. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> she would definitely come back for her dog. Yes. She would John Wick some people for her dog. Yes, which is again another reason I was getting these total John Wick's vibes because yeah. of the dog. And I thought if anything happens to Kuali, I'm going to riot. Yeah, I was... my two favorite characters were Kuali and Bernardino. Same, one hundred percent same. Although I do, I do enjoy Adol and I do enjoy Domingo like so much. I I really liked all of like most of the characters. My third Quite choice would probably have been Anna. Yeah, I mean I liked Kika too. She didn't last. She long, was peppy. But... Yeah, I liked her. I didn't trust her because she sounded so perky. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, Don't trust perky people. No. Um, Something else that I really loved and that it was given a name and I don't know that I've ever heard this name before. I've never heard this term. Arithmomania, which is apparently what it's called when you have the compulsion to count things. <laughs> and that was in this one. Yes. It was in this book. And we've been talking about that for the past, oh. like, I don't think we can talk about it anymore, Claire. I don't think we can say, oh, you never see it in books anymore, like, because it's literally. No, I think we need to stop. We need to think of something else. We do. This is the fictional hangover power all over again. We manifest things. You're right. What What can we manifest now in vampire books? Capes. <laughs> capes. <laughs> we're bringing back capes. Yes, we're bringing, yes, <laughs> yes. Um. <laughs> weird fucking vampires instead of sexy hot vampires okay should we start on one and then yeah we've got arithmomania taken care of that's we've sorted that back resurrected done yeah now we need to resurrect freaky ass vampires of different types yes and some of them might actually literally be resurrected that would be superb. Yeah. Um, you know what? I'm thinking about this bloody Bachelor, Bachelorette vampire book in my head yes. now. And I actually think it needs to be an anthology where different writers write the different dates for the different vampires. Yes, that would be amazing. Or that could be, Claire, the book that we write. The fictional hangover one of the many books that we need to write. Right, because we have so many. We have so many ideas. We should yeah. probably start writing. <laughs> we really maybe should. I mean, there are some podcasts out there that exist in the world that have books. I feel like at this point, we're five years in. We need to be like, okay, right. I'm on the Google Drive. New Google Doc. Book ideas. For us to write. <laughs> yes. We need to do okay, it. That, that, that's a bit long. It, it's now Book Ideas, we author. Yes. And also, you know, we've got some super fans that are editors and authors. Like, it could be a whole fictional hangover collaboration. Oh, my God. We could do a vampire book club anthology. We could. And we should. Um, there's one more thing that I like that I want to say, but I think we've probably talked about pretty much everything. Um, I really appreciated the fact that like the end, it, it wasn't a happy ending. Yes. Which we've talked about that before in several episodes, how we like that. Like it doesn't have to be wrapped up in a nice, neat little bow and they don't have to be happily in love at the end. I yes. appreciated that. So I did as well. Much. Yeah. I think as well. Atle and Domingo. Not, I'm not saying that the age gap is a problem because 
it's not really. I mean, he's 17, she's 21, 22. Yeah. 23, Something like, I think. 23. Yeah. It feels different because she's older. If it was a male to female, it's more of a grooming age crap, isn't it? Um, but I feel like they've both had their own personal growth within their time together. Mm-hmm. That it's right that they separate. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciated it. I liked it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I feel like there's like more that I want to talk about, but but I feel like we talked about everything. This book also wasn't super long to begin with. No, I think the audio... Well, we haven't talked about the audio book. Oh, we need to talk about the audio book. So, yes, we need to think talk about, about what we said at the beginning. This part two of the conversation. Yes. I have mixed feelings about the audio book. There was parts of it I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed Bernardino's narration. Yes. Because it was, like, deep and husky. Yes. And you can imagine, like, single malt whiskey kind of voice. Yeah. And it had like a gentle act. It was probably a more gentle accent, I thought, mm. out of all of them. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it. Yeah, there's something that that I didn't that I didn't like very much, and this happens in plenty of other books as well. And like, it even happens in the print version sometimes i don't think it happened in the print version of this one um but there were a lot of words which we thankfully for both of our sanities left out of the summary of this book there was so much really cool aztec language and like people people's names and place names and important like beliefs in Adel's religion and all of this stuff with all of these amazing words but then like at the same time whenever some of those words were said in the narration it was like said with a different inflection so Mm. you know it's a special word and I believe you know in in the book we're meant to believe that they are speaking Spanish to each other because why would they be speaking English? They're in fucking Mexico City. So I believe that we are led to believe that they are speaking Spanish the whole time, but obviously this book is written, you know, in English. Yes. Because there's one scene where they're talking about, like, where they're going to go after they go to Guatemala. And I was like, let's go to Brazil. And D'Amico's like, but uh, they don't speak Spanish in Brazil. And she's like, that's what you're worried about? You're traveling with a vampire across borders and you're worried about not speaking the language. So that's fine. But there were just, there were just some times the inflection changed and I didn't like it. I agree. I think, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. That's probably what kind of startled me out of the story, perhaps. Yeah. It's yeah. like when a, an accent or a voice of a character just is wrong, yeah, and it it and it, it it's jarring. And I think that yeah. I think you're, you're right. And like the narrator, which I feel badly because I don't recall her name. She I literally al- just looked it up and I totally forgot her. <laughs> she already has a like beautiful, fantastic voice and an you know, a slight accent that fits with the story. I just feel like we didn't need to spice up some of those words. I think it would have been fine without it because it was beautiful. The narration was great and all the characters sounded great and like everything was fantastic, but then there were just those words and you were like, who? Oh. The um, narrator, which I just put into our notes. Ida Rilusco, yep. Yep. And like I said, she did a fantastic job and her voice was beautiful and it was melodic and 
I don't know. It was great. But then there were just those words that like, why do you have to pronounce it so like, like it was underlined, you know, stressing the, some of the words. And yeah, I didn't like that. Took me out of yeah. it. Yeah. I think given what you said about the, what was the back of the book, I probably encourage people to pick the book to get that lore and those discussions and that yeah. extra information. Yeah. That's not covered in the, the audio. Yeah, it was not in the audio book. Yeah. The audio was not bad. Not bad at all. No, but it was jarring sometimes. But it was just jarring. There was just bits and pieces that just didn't quite feel smooth. Yeah. Um. So I'm glad that you were able to pick up on the specifics, actually. I'm just double checking the print book to see if any of this neat stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, this is a little bit different. There's a glossary in the back of the print. And it, but it does have the different types of vampires. But it also has vampires in the modern era and vampire religion. And then, no, and then it has very interesting words in the back and it describes what a Renfield is. So that's neat. The print copy also has neat stuff in the back. How fun is that? Love it. Because it's Love different. It to what is in the back of this book. There's an interview with her. There's this small vampire encyclopedia. The Encyclopedia Vampirica. Ooh. Um, and there's the interview. And then there's there's this section called, I Never Drink wine <laughs> and there's a recipe for a drink called the revenant oh and one called uh tanampa punch so it's just a fun drink that they would probably enjoy and then there's discussion questions too which i think is very neat i like it i like yeah. it yeah, and those are, they're good questions, too. That's fun. How fun. Discussion questions, which we never included. <laughs> Discussion. No, we don't. Well, it's serious stuff, and we rarely talk about oh. serious things. We were talking I mean, about a hip-hop horse. I was about to say. say the exact same fucking thing. For half of the book, we're talking about a hip-hop horse. Oh, but I need a hip-hop horse. I want a torture chamber. I want a torture chamber. I think it's time to play Would You Rather now. <laughs> right? <sighs> and only you think it's probably for best. Would you rather? Beep. We asked on social media, would you rather be a vampire with shark-like teeth or bird-like talons? On Facebook, 61% are having bird-like talons. On Instagram, 60% said bird-like talons. On Twitter, 67% said talons. And TikTok, teeth with 68%. Yeah. Okay. We have comments. We do have comments. Holland. Constance. Oh, ha ha ha. Oh. I know we started at the same time. Should we go first? Sure, this one's shorter. Constance on Facebook said, give me them claws. I'll be able to give others and myself the best back scratches. Oh, I like a good back scratch. Yeah, same. Yeah, okay. Colin on Facebook said, I'd only like the bird-like talons. If I could also fly, I'd be swooping in and, and picking up children and small animals all bloody day, dropping them from a great night height to crack open their tough shells, exposing their tasty, tasty meat underneath. Now, shark teeth come with their own set of positives and negatives. Negative, shark teeth will get in the way as much as the bird talons will. Positive, I've got motherfucking shark teeth, motherfucker. I'll just nom my way through whatever gets put in my way. Car, nom. Stick, nom. Tough shell children and small animals such as cats. Nom, fucking nom. But that doesn't answer the question, does it? I suppose you want me to choose now. 
I decide to live my hideous, muted, freak life as some kind of weirdo, no matter what I choose. Well, I won't. I'm not dancing to your tune, organ grinders. Find yourself another monkey. To which he replied, teeth, definitely teeth. <laughs> that was brilliant. It did also come with an apology to whoever has to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Coral on Facebook says, I would have to go with talons because if I'm a vampire, I already have shark teeth. She has. A very good point. Vincent on Facebook said, shark-like teeth. All of the biting, all the time. All vampires all the time. Yes. Bitey, all bitey, num, num. All the time. Author friend PC Cast on Facebook, said, definitely talons. I'd paint them awesome colors. <laughs> and Nina on Facebook said, shark teeth, talons would be an inconvenience. What if I need to pick up paper clips or wipe myself? But with a never-ending supply of renewing teeth, I'd be set. Constant chomping, nighttime gnashing, fist fights. It doesn't matter. I'd be growing a new layer soon. Pick a point. Spooky Aurelian on Instagram says, I think bird-like talons. But this is a really good question. I'll be thinking about it for a while. I like <laughs> that. I like to get inside people's heads. Nice. Sharon Joy Reed on Instagram said, definitely the talons. Imagine the dentist fees for those teeth. Oh. Well, they, don't, they just drop out. It's fine. Glim Glam Jen on Instagram says, I'm going with bird talons. Imagine the nail art you could get. Plus, I just think the shark teeth would be a bad deal for kissing and going to the dentist. I agree about the kissing. Because, like, when you kiss, if your teeth hit together, like, that's uncomfortable. And you got a whole mouthful of chompers. And they're all, like, not even in the different sizes and... They're all over. I the looked place. at a lot of shark mouths this past week and they are yeah, ugly. They are all over the place. Well, Psycho Noodle on Instagram is going for the teeth. I enjoy having the dexterity of fingers and thumbs. Hmm. The Tourmaline Renegade on Instagram says, I think I could deal with the teeth by never smiling. Same. Hmm. I like that. Uh, most uh, everybody at the library wanted shark teeth, too, because they love sharks. They like shark characters. They just like sharks. Apparently, everyone at the library likes sharks. Apparently, it was Shark Week at the library, <laughs> but not Shark Week. It was Shark Week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, what about you? Hmm. 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 Probably the talons. Yeah. Yeah, because, and so I know somebody said that like the like dexterity of having the thumbs, but we're saying they have the talent, so it's the nail aspect. Mm. So you know, I'm keeping my talent, my the thumbs. Yeah, I just think. Well, my nails are horrible anyway. And she always wears gloves, which yes. I think is a very neat thing that she she wears gloves to cover up because like her the tips of her fingers are like you know black yes talon looking but they do and, transform mm -hmm. but at least if you've got talent if you're in a fight i'm not having to actually put my mouth onto the person i'm trying to beat up yeah but, so I'm gonna I mean, go at the talons. same at the same time with that, you're a vampire, so you're fine with putting your mouth on people. Yeah. Well, that's true, but usually it's I don't know. I just find I I feel like I'm, I feel better with the talons than I do with the shark teeth. Possibly because I've been looking at a lot of shark teeth pictures, yeah. and they're just they're not nice. And do you know what else? Have you ever seen um, X-rays or pictures of sc children's heads, baby skulls? Yeah. And you just see the rows and rows of the teeth waiting to come through. Yeah. Freaks the shit out of me. 
Like when my, my little one, he hasn't got all his adult teeth, and I just look and think, oh. Like when he was a baby and he didn't have any teeth, I'm just like, it's all in there. It's all waiting to come through. And I was freaking myself over thinking about it. So, no. No. That's amazing. Hallens. Hallens. Bodies are horribly scary, ridiculously weird things. Yeah. I'm picking talons. I'm picking the teeth. Why of course you're picking question? the teeth. Why this is, is not a question for, for you. We don't need to ask this question for you. Never it's ask obvious. me a question about having scary ass teeth because that is not ass teeth, of course. <laughs> that's a totally different shot. That's a different that's a different thing. <laughs> it's like vagina dentata. There's also <laughs> ass dentata, apparently. Um <laughs> nope. we asked for that. We did. Um, I, I love the idea of terrifying teeth, like always. This is not a question. End of sentence. Moving Done. on. Next question. <laughs> Would you rather be a Renfield or a Van Helsing? Van Helsing. I it, Renfield is a slave. But what if you're Renfield like Nicholas Holt is Renfield and you get Still superpowers? Slave. Yeah, but he's, uh, the superpowers he's are Nicholas lovely. Nicholas Holt and he's beautiful. Yeah, but he's still a slave at the end of the day. That's the entire point of the movie. You're right. And question, the superpowers are great. Change. Question change. Hold on. Mid sentence question change. Would you rather be Nicholas Holt or who's a good Van Helsing? Hugh Jackman. <laughs> Would you rather be Nicholas Holt or Hugh Jackman? <laughs> Wasn't Mel Brooks um Van Helsing in Dead Loving It? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I just want to say rem- she would be rem- on God. <laughs> Oh, no, I, want to I watch can't Bayfair remember the name of the actor who played Renfield in that. I just remember he was also in Ali McBeal. That's, uh, that's... Yeah, Peter McNichol? Yes. <laughs> oh, I love that movie so much. I need to watch that movie again. Me too. I've got a feeling it's not on any of the streaming services. I'm going to have to try and get a physical copy. Luckily, I own that on DVD. I'm going to watch this. <laughs> oh, dear me. Okay. So this is where we to... just pause everybody. Don't mind us. We're just we checking do. what we've got. Yes. So do you want to be Nicholas Nicholas Holt or Hugh Jackman or Peter McNichol or Mel Brooks? You <laughs> matters. <laughs> I am going to Van Helsing. I am not going to be the slave to the vampire. I'm either going to be the vampire or I'm going to kill the vampire. Or I'm going to be Count Van Helsing and I'm going to be a vampire vampire hunter. That's what's happening. It's it's in the bag. Let's just move on. Yes. What, what are you doing? Um, if I get to be Nicholas Holt and have powers, then I'll be a Renfield. But otherwise, yeah, Vampire Vampire Hunter. Because I'm just thinking Guillermo in What We Do in the Shadows is a Renfield. But he's also a Vampire Hunter. He on is. But he, he's, <laughs> it's not on accident, it's genetics. And he, he, accidentally he wants vampires. to be a vampire, but Nando's never going to turn him. No. He's never going to be a vampire. And I love Guillermo. Me too. Me too. I also love it when he absolutely kicks vampire ass and his Van Helsing genetics just kick in. And the the one where his family's visiting and they're all just chasing after Nadia and they're all like just whopping these steaks with precision. (laughs) Okay. Moving on. Sorry. Next question. Let's do the next question. Would you rather sleep in a refrigerator, a closet, or a trunk? 
trunk. I'm choosing a trunk. I feel like I feel like can we closet... can we can we clarify? Is it trunk of a car or like a no, travel a tr- trunk? Uh, like a travel trunk. Yes. Yeah. Um. I feel like that would be the flattest. Yes, and <laughs> the easiest to get out of. Because, like, if you're in a closet, I mean, nobody could tell in the before times that I was, you know, recording in a closet because I had, like, fabric and stuff up around me. But it was hard to get in and out of there. So, and and a refrigerator, I'm just afraid that, like, the seal would shut and I wouldn't be able to get out. Do you remember that time that I got in the refrigerator for that book character cosplay when I was yes. Cinderella is dead and I got in the refrigerator? That was terrifying. And I had to have... My husband standing outside of it, although he was also acting in the video for me, like, you have got to open this door. It is scary as fuck in here. <laughs> and it was cold. The things was we do cold. for this podcast. No, I haven't done anything like that in a long, long no, time, and it really makes me sad. This is why people should join our Patreon. You get to see, like, you know, encourage us to do things like that. Yes. Getting into fridges. At least if you're in the refrigerator, you know... As we learned from the Indiana Jones movie that will remain nameless and does not really exist, right. you could survive and you could explore. <laughs> I want to go trunk just because if I'm going to do the vampire thing, then I can wake up in the morning and slam the door open and then just... Yes, that's right. It is also the most coffin-like. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's another good reason to choose trunk. Next question. You're not participating at all. Bystander. Would you rather witness the fight at the factory or the landfill? Landfill. Because I just want to see Bernardino going around, sucking the life force out of everybody, turning them into mummies, and then eventually getting Nick. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. That was, a, it was very good. But also, Claire, you have to keep in mind that you're surrounded by garbage. I have a terrible sense of smell. Okay. okay. And I will bring wet wipes. Okay. I do really like that fight. It was very, very good. And like, Adol with her wings coming out and, you know, clawing up his face with her talons. That was pretty great. But I don't know. I really want to see her have a fake seizure and stab somebody in the eye and throw a knife across the room in someone's forehead. I just thought that was really cool. Well, you watch that one. I'll watch the other one and then we can compare notes. Or, oh, like, we've got our phones with us. We can record and we can That's show true. each other. That's true. Um, I just had a thought. Oh, no. Yeah, uh, well... Mm. And I don't... I don't know if this is going to be good. Oh, no. When Adol picks up Nick at the end in her bird form... She's, like, got a hold of his face with her talons. However, her hand is growing back. She doesn't have a full hand at that time. She might have had three fingers. That's probably enough to pick somebody up with. Yeah. But, like, when her hand, when she transforms, is her... Is her bird hand also growing back? It would have to be. Yeah. Because at the end, it's like, you know, she's got her she's got her hand back. But that's questionable. Hmm. I feel like I need to reread that section. It doesn't say anything about like mm. a half talon. She's like she just grabs him in the face. Is it her feet? 
It depends. Beat talons? Because she well, could. Yeah. Well, do, does it explain where what happens to her arms? Does she retain her arms, or do the arms become part of the wing? I believe she still has arms. Okay. Because so, the wings come out of her back. I she, think it might be a feet. Feet talons? So she just yeah. like bursts out of her shoes? And then she has really dexterous toes. Well, they are talons. With bird feet. Maybe it's maybe well. It's, it's not explained hand. if she has the same amount of digits in human form as she does in bird form. No, no. So it could. It might not be that she's got. I feel like oh. if that were the case, she wouldn't be so sad about losing her hand. Because, like, if she only has you know three fingers like this with their talons, I feel like she wouldn't be that upset. About no, I, th- I think she's got five digits. I think she she she's human passing in human form. Yeah. Is there important questions? I don't think we're going to get the answer unless you author gave it to us. Or if it's in the back of either the ebook or the physical book. It might be. I There's think. your homework. Yeah. We homework. can talk about it in Vampire Book Club. Yes. And this video is going to be going up, you know, soon. So everyone will have access to it. So if you want to join in on this discussion, come to Vampire Book Club on Tuesday. Check out Facebook for details. Would you are there? Yes. And we will ask you guys at Vampire Book Club. Would you rather be the minder for the son of a vampire gang leader who is an annoying prick of a vampire? Or kills at, who also kills indiscriminately and leaves a trail of bodies behind you to deal with. Or be a female cop on a crooked force known as a, being a vampire hunter who no one respects and you're surrounded by misogyny. I'm a badass female cop. Fine. I want to have to hang out with fucking Nick. And babysit Nick? I I couldn't nah. do that. Nah. Nah, dog. Uh-uh. Nah, dog. Not nah. happening. I'd um, rather I... go on a rip roaring rampage of revenge in the force. Yeah, I'd much rather <laughs> be a badass female inside. cop. I would be a badass female cop who's been on the force too long and has to leave and set up her own private detective agency. Yeah. Consult- yeah. Consultancy. And you're like kind of grizzled? Yeah, yeah. You know, because you've been at it for too long. There is a homicide detective in a book that we're going to be talking about in a couple of weeks' time who is also my favourite character in the book. <laughs> and you are going to freaking love her. No, okay. I'm excited. I'm excited about this. All right. Um, favourite final thought quote? Uh, one, two, three, four, four, four. Ah, ah, ah. Counted like it counted. Count. <laughs> he also likes stories and comic books about vampires. They seemed exotic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the do, Domingo. Yeah, the do. This time, she did attempt a small amount of kindness, probably because she was tired or, you know, going crazy. <laughs> I love that one. Freaking relatable. You can't go around believing that you're shit, all right? I said it was a shitty job, not that you were shitty. I have said something very similar yeah. very recently to someone. And it infuriates me. It's a shitty job. You aren't shitty. Yeah. The circumstances are shitty, not you. Not you. Another thing that I think I say quite often is kill and fuck kill and fuck all the same for them and the same for us all eventually i had a feeling you were gonna pick that one because i like you said it before like all vampires care about is killing Killing and fucking fucking. killing and fucking it's very good what do you got um let's see there's i i got some good ones i feel like 
humans are not very nice either, Domingo said. Domingo didn't want to say that everyone was an asshole, but many people are assholes. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not interested in discussing vampires in cheap novels. <laughs> when that they were having that conversation, I was like, well, we yes same and then also following up with this one but then again been a big reader of romance books <laughs> same same seas killing fuck killing folks. <laughs> and finally aren't you averse to people and noise and well everything <laughs> yes yes i am Ugh, same bernardino same <laughs> hmm. okay if you liked this try this what are you going to share i found this on a latinx um a couple of different actual Latinx um, YA mm. book lists. Mm -hmm. And it's The Haunting of Alejandra by V. Castro. Alejandra no longer knows who she is. To her husband, she is a wife. And to her children, a mother. To her own adoptive mother, she is a daughter. But they cannot see who Alejandra has become. A woman struggling with a darkness that threatens to consume her. Nor can they see what Alejandra sees. In times of despair, a ghostly vision appears to her, the apparition of a crying woman in a ragged white gown. When Alejandra visits a therapist, she begins exploring her family's history, starting with the biological mother she never knew. As she goes deeper into the lives of the women in her family, she learns that heartbreak and tragedy are not the only things she has in common with her ancestors. Because the crying woman was with them too. She is La Lorna the vengeful and murderous mother of Mexican legend. Yeah. And she will not leave Alejandra for her, until Alejandra follows her mother, her grandmother, and all the women who came before her into the darkness. But Alejandra has inherited more than just pain. She has inherited the strength and the courage of her foremothers, and she will have, the, and she will have to summon everything they have given her to banish the Lorna forever. I thought that sounded really interesting. Oh, I love the tale of La Llorona too. It's fantastic. And there's kind of it's kind of like um like in Hex You, the mm. the lady who, you know, the serpent lady who drowns people in the river. Yeah. Eats them. It's, it's kind of the same thing. I love it. I it, love it, that. It sounded like at first as I was reading the summary for it, I was like, oh, is this going to be like a commentary on mental health, perhaps? And I'm not sure how well it's going to, you know, address that. Yeah. But it seemed to be on two or three different lists while I was looking um for that next. And when I start going into the the mythology with La Lorna, I was like, oh, I actually, was, I was really hoping that as you were reading the summary, I was like, this sounds like. Sounds like La Llorona. It does. And I was really hoping that she was going to, like, become her. And I thought, well, that would be amazing. But then well, we you don't said, know. like, that's true. We don't know. But I was just thinking, like, man, this sounds, that's what that's what the story is going to be about. And then you said it, and I was like, yes. Maybe she does. We don't know. I've not we read it. Know. You're right. We don't know. So it could be that they are the crying women that yeah, they are the little Lorna. Yeah, she's got to be dragged into the darkness so she can be a creep and become the monster. Yeah. So that would be so good. We'd have to read That's and fun. find out. Yeah. But what have you got? Well, I am going to suggest another Sylvia Moreno Garcia book, Mexican Gothic. Oh, I tried to get to read that last year. But the halls were insane. And by the time the halls yeah. at the library came through, I was deep into summarizing and I never got the chance to read it. I did get to read it. And it was very interesting. Oh, so, okay. Here's the summary. 
After receiving a frantic letter from her newlywed cousin begging for someone to save her from a mysterious doom, Noemi Taboda heads to High Place, a distant house in the Mexican countryside. She's not sure what she will find. Her cousin's husband, a handsome Englishman, is a stranger, and Noemi knows little about the region. Noemi is also an unlikely rescuer. She's a glamorous debutante, and her chic gowns and perfect red lipstick are more suited for cocktail parties than amateur sleuthing. But she's also tough and smart with an indomitable will, and she's not afraid. Not of her husband, not of her cousin's new husband, who is both menacing and alluring. Not of his father, the ancient patriarch who seems to be fascinated by Noemi. And not even of the house itself, which begins to invade Noemi's dreams with visions of blood and doom. Ooh. Her only ally in this inhospitable abode is the family's youngest son. Shy and gentle, he seems to want to help Noemi, but might also be hiding dark knowledge of his family's past. For there are many secrets behind the walls of High Place. The family's once colossal wealth and faded mining empire kept them from prying eyes, but as Noemi digs deeper, she unearths stories of violence and madness. And Noemi, mesmerized by the terrifying yet seductive world of High Place, may soon find it impossible to ever leave this enigmatic house behind. Ooh. Yeah, it was it was very interesting. Did not go the way I thought it was going to go, but was pretty delicious at the same time. I need to read it. Yeah. Do we have anything in the new indie spotlight? <laughs> we do. Um... It's not indie this time, which we don't okay. always do indie. That's no, why it's called no. new and indie. Or sometimes uh, just spotlight. Sometimes just a spotlight, yeah. Uh, so this one is also by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Hey, take that apology back. I insist. <laughs> This one is called Silver Nitrate, and it comes out in just a few weeks on July 18th. Montserrat has always been overlooked. She's a talented sound editor, but she's left out of the boys club running the film industry in 90s Mexico City. Hello, a fantastic 90s book. It'll be great. And she's all but invisible to her best friend, Tristan, a charming, if faded, soap opera star though she's been in love with him since childhood then tristan discovers his new neighbor is the cult horror director abel ureta and the legendary auteur claims he can change their lives if his tale of a nazi occultist imbuing magic into highly volatile silver nitrate stock sounds like sheer fantasy the magic film was never finished, which is why Yoretta swears his career vanished overnight. He's cursed. Now the director wants Montserrat and Tristan to help him shoot the missing scene and lift the curse, but Montserrat soon notices a dark presence following her, and Tristan begins seeing the ghost of his ex-girlfriend. As they work together to unravel the mystery of the film and the obscure occultist who once roamed their city, Montserrat and Tristan may find that sorcerers and magic are not only the stuff of movies. Ooh. There are so many good things in that summary. Where to start? Sounds fantastic. It comes it out in a couple weeks. Nice probably be getting that one immediately <laughs> oh it was already in yeah, yeah probably have already purchased it for the library actually <laughs> so, so hold on a second that's it for this episode of fictional hangover but i don't know what we're reading next well, before we talk about what we're reading next, Amanda, I need to remind you that our next Vampire Book Club episode is going to be a live. 
it is going to be a live episode and it's also going to be weird so we just I feel like we need to just say in advance like sorry for how weird it's going to be because like I'm going to be on vacation and just the way the recording schedule is lining up like we were going to do you know 250 episode live but like vacation time and stuff it didn't quite line up. No, and so, I suspect I've I've got a few work commitments as well in yeah. July. So like we're probably both gonna be like out of our comfort zone. Cause yeah, I don't know. It's gonna be weird. We can't record a proper episode. Right. So the easiest thing to do is alive. Is alive, yes, because it won't it won't be as long. <laughs> it's just, it's just plain easier for us to do it that it's way much, so we much are going to do to a live way. and it's going to be on friday the 21st of july yes so it's in time for vampire book club and it'll yes. be in time for the audio to be ready for the podcast we haven't got a time set yet yeah because like i say there's certain things that we need to work out yeah. logistics wise but it's probably going to be in the evening like you know i'm, I'm going to be on vacation i'm probably going to need to take a nap so like i don't know i don't know what time it's going to be probably Poss- possibly the vampire book club use typical time maybe Maybe, maybe we can do that. Maybe that'll be the best time. Keep an eye on our socials, though. We are going yes. to let you know as soon yeah. as we can. But just be prepared. There is going to be a live on July the 21st. Yes, that sounds great. So. But next um, week, we are covering a different book. <laughs> Who I can't remember the year. I, I've, I've I've done the summary for it. It's fine. It's unfamiliar by Haley Newsom. Okay, join us next time as we discuss Unfamiliar by Haley Newsom. Look out for our Would You Rather polls on social media. Don't forget about our book club and monthly challenges on Facebook. Be sure to visit our shop on Redbubble at fictionalhangof.redbubble.com for all your favorite fictional hangover-themed merchandise. And become a patron of ours on Patreon at patreon.com slash fictionalhangover. Until next time, remember, the only cure for a fictional hangover is another book. <laughs>